Life in our small town of Redwood was supposed to be simple and predictable. Nestled in a quiet valley, it was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else's business. I, Thomas, had lived here all my life, just like my parents before me. My wife Emma moved here after we got married, and we had settled into what I thought was a blissful life. We had two kids, a boy named Sam, age 10, and a girl named Lily, who was eight. Our home was a modest two-story house on Maple Street, a place filled with memories of laughter and love. Emma was the perfect wife, or so I thought. She was beautiful, charming, and could light up any room she walked into. Our marriage, now in its fifteenth year, had its ups and downs, but I always believed we were rock solid. I worked as a manager at the local hardware store, a job that kept me busy, but allowed me to provide for my family. Emma worked part-time at the library, a job she adored because it allowed her to be home when the kids came back from school. We were a typical family in a typical town, living what I assumed was a typical life. Our weekends were filled with soccer games, barbecues, and family outings. Every Sunday we attended the local church where Emma sang in the choir, her voice like an angel's. I was proud of my family and content with the life we had built together. But beneath the surface of our idyllic life, something sinister was brewing. Emma's behavior had started to change in subtle ways that I was too blind to notice at first. Our small, seemingly perfect world was about to be shattered in the most unexpected and devastating way. It all started with little things. Emma became increasingly preoccupied with her appearance. She'd spend hours in front of the mirror, meticulously doing her hair and makeup, something she hadn't done with such intensity since our early days of dating. I brushed it off, thinking she just wanted to feel good about herself. Then there were the phone calls and texts. Emma's phone, which used to lie around the house like any other household item, was now always in her hand or tucked away in her purse. Whenever it buzzed, she would glance at it quickly, her face lighting up with a smile she tried to hide. When I asked who she was chatting with, she'd always say it was a friend from her book club or a parent from the kids' school. The explanations seemed plausible, so I didn't press further. Our sex life, once passionate and fulfilling, had dwindled to almost nothing. Whenever I tried to initiate intimacy, Emma would turn me down claiming she was tired or not in the mood. I began to feel a growing distance between us, a gap that hadn't been there before. I tried to bridge it by planning romantic dinners and spontaneous weekend getaways, but Emma always had an excuse. She was too busy, the kids needed her, or she just wasn't feeling well. Her mood swings became more pronounced. One moment she'd be sweet and loving, the next she'd snap at me for the smallest things. I started walking on eggshells around her unsure of what might set her off. The warmth and laughter that once filled our home were being replaced by tension and silence. I noticed changes in her routine, too. She'd often leave the house without telling me where she was going, only to return hours later with vague explanations. She started working late at the library, even though her part-time job rarely required it. I'd call her during these late hours, and her responses were always hurried, as if she was anxious to get off the phone. The biggest red flag came when my brother David started visiting us more frequently. David and I had always been close, but he had never been a regular visitor to our home. Suddenly he seemed to have a reason to drop by almost every other day. At first I thought he was just trying to reconnect, but his visits always coincided with times when Emma was alone at home or when I was working late. I started to feel a gnawing suspicion, but I couldn't bring myself to believe it. Emma and David had always gotten along well but it had never crossed my mind that there could be something more than familial affection between them. I tried to push the doubts away, telling myself I was overthinking things. After all, this was my wife and my brother, two people I loved and trusted more than anyone else in the world. But the nagging feeling wouldn't go away. It kept me up at night, replaying moments and conversations in my head, looking for clues I might have missed. I decided to keep a closer eye on them hoping to prove my suspicions wrong and find some peace of mind. Little did I know, I was about to uncover a betrayal that would change everything. It was a Thursday evening, and I had come home early from work, hoping to surprise Emma with a date night. As I pulled into the driveway, I noticed David's car parked out front. My stomach tightened, but I tried to dismiss the uneasy feeling. Maybe he just needed to talk or borrow something. I walked through the front door quietly, hoping to catch them off guard. The house was unusually silent, 
the kind of silence that feels heavy and intentional. I headed toward the kitchen, but found it empty. The kids were at a friend's house for a sleepover, so I knew it was just Emma and David at home. As I climbed the stairs, I heard faint voices coming from our bedroom. My heart pounded in my chest, each step feeling like an eternity. The door was slightly ajar, and as I approached, I could make out their conversation. Emma's voice was soft, almost a whisper, and David's was low and reassuring. I pushed the door open just enough to see inside. What I saw made my blood run cold. There, on our bed, was Emma, partially undressed, with David leaning over her. Their clothes were strewn around the room, and the look on their faces was one of intimacy and familiarity that went far beyond sibling affection. For a moment I stood frozen, unable to process the scene before me. Emma, my wife, the mother of my children, was entangled with my brother, betraying me in the most profound way possible. A wave of nausea washed over me as I tried to steady myself. Rage and heartbreak erupted within me, and I kicked the door open, making it slam against the wall. Emma and David sprang apart, their faces a mix of shock and guilt. Emma grabbed a sheet to cover herself, while David hastily pulled on his pants. What the hell is going on here? I shouted, my voice trembling with anger. Emma's eyes were wide with panic. Thomas, I can explain, she stammered, but her words sounded hollow and meaningless. David, looking pale and ashamed, tried to speak. Tom, I'm so sorry, I- Shut up! I roared, pointing at him. How could you do this to me? Both of you! In our home, in our bed! Emma started to cry, but her tears only fueled my fury. It's not what it looks like she said between sobs. It just happened. It didn't mean anything. Didn't mean anything? I repeated, incredulous. You're screwing my brother, and you say it doesn't mean anything? How long has this been going on? Emma looked at David, silently pleading for him to help, but he just hung his head. A few months, she admitted quietly. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. Months? You've been lying to me for months? Tom, please, David began, but I cut him off. Get out, I shouted. Both of you, get out of my house. David grabbed his shirt and shoes, avoiding my gaze as he hurried past me. Emma stayed on the bed, her face buried in her hands, sobbing uncontrollably. I said get out, Emma, I repeated, my voice colder now, the initial rage giving way to a deep, seething anger. She looked up at me, her face streaked with tears. Thomas, please, let's talk about this. I love you. You don't get to say that, I snapped. You don't get to claim you love me after this. Pack your things and leave. We're done. Emma got dressed slowly, her hands trembling. She tried to touch my arm as she walked past, but I pulled away, disgusted. I followed her downstairs, watching as she threw some clothes into a suitcase. Before she left, she turned to me one last time. I'm so sorry, Thomas. I never meant to hurt you. But her words were empty, and I couldn't bear to hear them. Just go. I said, my voice barely more than a whisper. As the door closed behind her, the reality of what had happened sank in. The woman I loved, the brother I trusted, they had both betrayed me in the most unimaginable way. I sank to the floor, overwhelmed by a grief and anger so profound I could hardly breathe. The life I thought I had was shattered, and nothing would ever be the same again. The days that followed were a haze of anger, heartbreak, and plotting. I couldn't bear the thought of Emma and David getting away with what they had done. My mind churned with thoughts of revenge, each one more vindictive than the last. I wanted them to feel the pain I was feeling, to suffer as I had suffered. I knew I had to be smart about this. A hasty act of vengeance would only backfire, and I needed to make sure they both paid dearly. I started gathering evidence, documenting everything I could about their affair. Text messages, emails, anything that could be used to expose them. Emma had moved in with a friend temporarily, and David was lying low, probably hoping I would calm down and let things blow over. But I had no intention of letting this slide. My first target was David. He had always been the golden boy in the family, the one who could do no wrong. It was time to tarnish that image. David worked at a respectable law firm in the city. He had built a solid reputation for himself, and his career was flourishing. I decided to hit him where it hurt the most. Using the evidence I'd gathered, I crafted an anonymous letter detailing his affair with Emma, complete with screenshots of their explicit messages. I sent the letter to his boss, making sure it would land on his desk first thing Monday morning. The fallout was immediate. David was called into a meeting with the partners, 
and within hours, he was suspended pending an internal investigation. The firm's reputation was at stake, and they couldn't afford to have a scandal involving one of their top lawyers. David's carefully constructed career began to unravel, and the news spread like wildfire among our family and friends. He was humiliated, and it was only the beginning. Next, I turned my attention to Emma. She had always prided herself on being a respected member of our community, active in local charities and events. I decided to expose her affair in a way that would leave no room for her to defend herself. I created a fake social media account and posted the evidence of her infidelity on the town's community page, making sure to tag everyone we knew. The backlash was swift and brutal. Emma's friends and acquaintances were shocked and disgusted. The whispers and gossip spread through Redwood like wildfire. She was shunned by the very community she had once been a part of. Her part-time job at the library was put on indefinite hold, as the board couldn't have someone involved in such a scandal representing them. But I wasn't done. I wanted to ensure that both of them felt the sting of their betrayal for a long time. I filed for divorce, citing infidelity and seeking full custody of our children. Emma's lawyer tried to negotiate, but I was relentless. I used the evidence of her affair to strengthen my case, and the judge granted me full custody. Emma was given limited visitation rights, and the terms were strict. She was devastated, but there was nothing she could do. As for David, his suspension turned into a termination. The investigation revealed other indiscretions, and his career was effectively over. He moved out of town, unable to face the disgrace he had brought upon himself. Our parents were heartbroken, but they couldn't bring themselves to defend him. The bond between us was irreparably broken, and I knew it would never heal. In the end, I got what I wanted. They had both lost everything, just as I had. But instead of feeling satisfaction, I was left with an emptiness that revenge couldn't fill. The pain of betrayal still lingered, but at least now, they knew the consequences of their actions. They had both paid the price, and I could begin to rebuild my life without them. Weeks turned into months, and the dust began to settle. Emma had been living in a small apartment on the edge of town, isolated and shunned by the community. David had disappeared from our lives entirely leaving behind a wake of disgrace and broken trust. The kids were adjusting, though the scars of the ordeal were still visible in their eyes. One afternoon I received a call from Emma. Her voice was subdued, stripped of the confidence and charm that once characterized her. She asked if we could meet, saying she needed to talk to me. Reluctantly, I agreed. I chose a quiet cafe on the outskirts of town, a neutral ground where we could have some semblance of privacy. As I entered the cafe, I saw her sitting at a corner table, staring out the window. She looked different, gaunt, with dark circles under her eyes and a weariness that spoke of sleepless nights and relentless regret. I sat down across from her, and for a moment we just looked at each other, the weight of everything unspoken hanging heavily between us. Thank you for meeting me, Thomas, she began, her voice barely above a whisper. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. The anger had subsided. But the pain remained, a dull ache that refused to heal. I know I've lost the right to ask for anything from you, she continued, but I wanted to apologize, truly and deeply. I've had a lot of time to think about everything, and I realize now how much I've destroyed. Her words were sincere, but they felt like too little, too late. Why, Emma? I finally asked, my voice cracking. Why did you do it? She looked down at her hands, twisting them nervously. I wish I could give you a clear answer, Thomas. I was lonely. I felt neglected. And David, he was there. It doesn't excuse anything. It was wrong and I'm so sorry. I shook my head, the old wounds reopening. Do you have any idea what you've done to our family? To the kids? To me? Tears welled up in her eyes. I do, and it's killing me inside. I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, but I need you to understand that I never stopped loving you. I was just so lost. You say you love me. But your actions say otherwise, I replied, my voice steadier now. Love isn't just a feeling, Emma. It's a commitment, a promise. You broke that promise in the worst way possible. She nodded, tears streaming down her face. I know, I know. And I'll regret it for the rest of my life. I just... I want to make things right as much as I can. 
How do you plan to do that? I asked, my tone skeptical. I've been going to therapy, she said softly, trying to understand myself and my actions. I want to be a better person for myself and for the kids. I know I can't undo the past, but I want to be there for them in any way you'll allow. I sighed, the weight of the decision pressing down on me. The kids need stability, Emma. They need to know they can trust the people in their lives. Right now, that's me. I won't keep them from you, but you have to earn back their trust and mine. She nodded, a glimmer of hope in her eyes. I will, Thomas, I promise, whatever it takes. We sat in silence for a few moments, the enormity of our situation sinking in. Finally, I stood up. I have to go. The kids will be home from school soon. Emma looked up at me, her expression a mix of sorrow and gratitude. Thank you, Thomas, for listening. I nodded and walked out of the cafe, feeling a mix of emotions, anger, sadness, but also a small tentative hope that maybe, just maybe, we could find a way to heal. As I drove home, I realized that while the road ahead would be long and difficult, it was a journey we had to take. For the sake of our children, for our own sanity, we had to try and move forward, even if it was one painful step at a time. The weeks leading up to the trial were some of the most stressful of my life. I spent countless hours with my lawyer, going over every detail of my case, preparing for what was sure to be a brutal court battle. Emma had hired a formidable attorney as well, determined to fight for her rights and maintain as much contact with the children as possible. The courtroom was cold and imposing, a stark contrast to the warmth and comfort of our family home. As I sat at the plaintiff's table, I couldn't help but feel the weight of what was about to unfold. Emma was seated across from me, looking anxious but resolute. We exchanged brief, strained glances before the judge entered and called the court to order. The proceedings began with opening statements from both sides. My lawyer painted a picture of a devoted husband and father betrayed by his wife's infidelity, emphasizing the emotional trauma and the impact on our children. Emma's lawyer, on the other hand, focused on her remorse, her efforts to seek therapy, and her desire to remain an active part of our children's lives. The evidence was laid out methodically. My lawyer presented the messages, the photos, and the timeline of the affair, highlighting the deceit and the breach of trust. Each piece of evidence felt like a dagger, reopening wounds I had tried to heal. Emma's lawyer countered with character witnesses and documentation of her therapy sessions, attempting to show that she was committed to change. When it was time for testimonies, I took the stand first. I recounted the day I discovered the affair, the confrontation that followed, and the months of pain and betrayal. I spoke about the impact on our children, their confusion, and their heartbreak. My voice wavered at times, but I remained steadfast in my resolve. Emma's testimony was equally emotional. She tearfully apologized, not just to me but to the court, for her actions. She spoke about her loneliness, her regret, and her desire to make amends. Her lawyer asked her about the therapy she had been undergoing and the steps she was taking to become a better person. The cross-examination was grueling. My lawyer pressed Emma on the details of her affair, questioning her sincerity and highlighting inconsistencies in her story. Emma's lawyer did the same to me, probing my reactions, my actions since the discovery, and my ability to co-parent effectively. Witnesses were called, friends, family members, and even the children's teachers testified about the changes they had observed in our family dynamics. Some spoke in my favor, describing my dedication and stability. Others spoke for Emma, highlighting her involvement in the community and her efforts to rebuild her life. The trial dragged on for days, each session more draining than the last. The judge listened intently, taking notes and occasionally interjecting with questions. As the trial neared its conclusion, both sides made their closing arguments, summarizing their cases and pleading for a favorable verdict. Finally, the day came for the judge to deliver the ruling. The courtroom was filled with a tense silence as he began to speak. He acknowledged the pain and betrayal that had occurred, the efforts both parties had made to move forward, and the well-being of the children as the primary concern. In light of the evidence presented, the judge began, I find that the plaintiff has made a compelling case for full custody. However, it is also clear that the defendant has shown genuine remorse and a desire to be part of her children's lives. Therefore, 
I am granting primary custody to the plaintiff with structured visitation rights for the defendant. The relief washed over me, tempered by the recognition of the long road ahead. Emma's face was a mixture of sadness and acceptance. The judge continued, outlining the specific terms of visitation and emphasizing the need for both of us to work together for the sake of our children. As the court adjourned, I felt a sense of closure, though not triumph. The trial had been a necessary step, but it was not the end. There would still be challenges, still be difficult conversations and healing to do. But with the court's decision, I had the stability I needed to start rebuilding our lives. Emma approached me as we left the courtroom. Thank you, Thomas, she said quietly, for being fair. I'll do everything I can to make this work for the kids. I nodded, too exhausted to say much. We'll figure it out, I replied. And for the first time in a long while, I felt a glimmer of hope that maybe, just maybe, we could find a way forward for the sake of Sam and Lily. The months following the trial were a period of adjustment and gradual healing. With the custody arrangement in place, I focused on creating a stable and nurturing environment for Sam and Lily. Our home, once filled with tension and uncertainty, began to feel like a sanctuary again. I threw myself into my role as a father, making sure the kids knew they were loved and supported. I helped Sam with his soccer practice, attended Lily's dance recitals, and made time for family dinners where we could talk about our day and share our thoughts. The bond between us grew stronger, and I could see them beginning to heal from the trauma of our family's upheaval. Emma adhered to the visitation schedule strictly, showing up on time and making an effort to be present and engaged during her time with the kids. While our relationship remained strained, we managed to keep our interactions civil for Sam and Lily's sake. The children, though still wary, seemed to appreciate the stability and the effort we both put into making their lives as normal as possible. One Saturday, as I watched Sam score a goal in his soccer game, I felt a sense of pride and contentment that I hadn't experienced in a long time. Lily cheered from the sidelines, her face glowing with excitement. These moments, small but significant, reminded me of what I was fighting for the happiness and well-being of my children. At work, I found solace in the routine and the support of my colleagues. They had stood by me through the worst of it, and their encouragement helped me regain my confidence. My boss, understanding the toll the past months had taken on me, even gave me more flexible hours so I could be there for my kids when they needed me most. It was during one of these quieter afternoons at work that I ran into Rachel. She was an old friend from high school someone I hadn't seen in years. We caught up over coffee, reminiscing about the past and sharing stories about our lives. Rachel had gone through her own set of challenges, including a difficult divorce, and our conversations quickly turned into mutual support sessions. Rachel's presence in my life became a source of comfort and perspective. She understood the complexities of starting over, the doubts and fears that came with it. We started spending more time together, going for walks, having dinners, and just talking about everything under the sun. It was refreshing to have someone who understood without judgment, who listened and shared in my journey. As the seasons changed, so did my outlook on life. The bitterness and anger that had once consumed me began to fade, replaced by a cautious optimism. I realized that while the past had been painful, it had also made me stronger, more resilient. I was rebuilding my life piece by piece, and in the process, discovering new aspects of myself. One evening, after tucking the kids into bed, I sat on the porch with Rachel. The air was cool, the sky clear and dotted with stars. We talked about our hopes and dreams, the future we wanted to build. For the first time in a long while, I felt a sense of peace. Thomas, Rachel said, breaking the comfortable silence. You've come a long way. I'm proud of you. I smiled, looking at her. I couldn't have done it without you, I admitted. You've helped me see that there's life beyond the pain, that it's possible to move forward and find happiness again. Rachel reached for my hand, her touch warm and reassuring. We all deserve a second chance, Thomas. You, me, the kids, even Emma in her own way. What matters is what we do with it. Her words resonated deeply. It was true. We all had the chance to start anew, to make better choices, to build a life defined not by betrayal and hurt, but by love and hope. As the months turned into years, Rachel and I grew closer, 
eventually blending our lives in a way that felt natural and right. She became a beloved figure in Sam and Lily's lives, offering them the warmth and stability they needed. Together, we created new traditions, new memories, and a new sense of family. Looking back, I realized that the journey through betrayal and heartache had led me to a place of understanding and resilience. I had learned to value myself, to recognize my worth, and to prioritize the well-being of my children above all else. Emma and I continued to co-parent effectively, and while our relationship was forever altered, we found a way to coexist peacefully for the sake of our kids. In the end, I discovered that life, despite its unexpected twists and turns, had the potential to bring about growth and renewal. I had faced the storm and emerged stronger, ready to embrace the future with hope and determination. And as I stood on the porch that evening, with Rachel by my side and my children safe and happy inside, I knew that we were on the right path, one filled with promise, healing, and the possibility of a brighter tomorrow.